Hello, good morning, good evening, good night, dear listener. It's Adam here, as always. This episode, I was recording on the wrong microphone. Because I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. I didn't realise this happened. So as a result, because I'm an idiot and a fool, and a fool of a tuck, the, my audio isn't great. Yeah, I didn't realise that had happened. Because, as I say, I'm an idiot. I'm a fool of a tuck. Hmm, sorry about that. My apologies, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Bye-bye. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Freed from Humpty Dumpty's mortal shell emerged Glowhawk, devourer of the infinite. All the king's horses and all the king's men fought valiantly against the Aeonian horror, but alas, were no match for its relentless hunger. Glowhawk lay waste to the land, imprisoned the souls of the consumed within its internal abyss, and ushered in an age of ruin from which mankind would never survive. Every man lives, not every man truly dies. <laughs> yeah. We have to the Bob the Builder intro, but with chaos. <laughs> I would like to say that that was something that I wrote. It isn't. It's something I found on Facebook, and full credit to the person who made it, because it's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> it's did, very hard to say. Bob the Builder, uh, uh, Abaddon with the spoiler, can he break it? Abaddon with the spoiler, yes he can. Abaddon. Oh, Bob the Builder, that'd be Perturabo, wouldn't it? I like the idea of rubbing it in that like Abaddon blew up Cadia. <laughs> <laughs> it's what the Black Legion would sing to the Cadians to say kill them again and again and again. Make them cry, and demoralize them. It. No, you can't. No, we broke it. <laughs> Abaddon, can we kill it? Abaddon, yes, we did. Abaddon. <laughs> It's all gone now. Ah, uh, dawn. But then that brings up the whole new conversation about uh, the uh, Mighty Machines movie that's in the Bob the Builder canon. What? The what? The what? now? Yeah, there's a movie. There's a Bob the Builder movie. It's called Mighty Machines. And it okay. stars... Um, Not oh, big what's his name? The guy who was um, in X-Men 2 is uh, Stryker. Oh, that guy. I don't know his name. I know uh, who he is. Brian Cox. Brian Cox, thank you. Yeah, yeah. that's the one. Yeah, Brian I Cox. Yeah. Yeah, Brian Cox is the evil foreman in the well, Bob he's the very Builder. Good. He's very good as a bad guy, but he's Brian Cox. So, you know, obviously, I mean, he played. He was the original Hannibal, of course. He was. Red Dragon, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, Manhunter. Manhunter, sorry. Manhunter, yeah. <clears throat> Naughty. Yeah, very, I mean, very interesting film indeed. No, not, hey. not astronomer Brian Cox, Big B. Not that guy. No, no not that one. No, the well, other maybe, one. Maybe it was him. He could be Hannibal no, Lecter. That would mean that Brian Cox was in Manhunter, he so was he in was X-Men, born. and he was in D-Ream. And I am all up for that. The idea oh, of this no. thick Yorkshire accent. Things can only get better. <laughs> Please don't ever tell me that again, Brian Cox. I'm scared. <laughs> I'm terrified of everything you might have to do. Uh, Who's how in the new Lord of the Rings cartoon? Oh, interesting. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it, yeah, we were just it talking about that. We? Oh. It look, I haven't seen anything about it. So it's uh, it's know. based on his daughter. Uh, so it's about her rising to prominence and doing that kind of story. You know how there's okay. the story about ha- Hammerhand, and there's the the story surrounding mm-hmm. him. It's not about him. Yeah. It's about his daughter. Oh, okay. The one thing I took away from the Lord of the Rings animated movie um, trailer was how many frames of animation do you like with your uh, cartoons? Oh, it depends. Two. <laughs> yeah, it depends. <laughs> two frames. Yeah. Man. So it's it's not like the Bakshi cartoon then? No, it's more like a GIF. Uh, oh, right, okay. <laughs> it's Interesting. 
the, the frame rate was stutteringly bad. It was insane. I, I haven't even got further than what it's actually about because I took one look at the frame rate and we just went, no. It doesn't, look like, it doesn't look like Lord of the Rings. It doesn't sound like Lord of the Rings again. So it's like, no, no, thank you. No. Mm. I mean, it's fascinating because Lord of the Rings has a kind of checkered history with animation, which is really interesting considering you'd think it would be perfect. Just the perfect format for an adaptation of the Lord of the Rings, right? What are you talking about? Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings and its entirety <laughs> of storytelling. I love how it ends. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I don't know how it ends. And it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't bother. Yeah. Just this voiceover comes in and thus ends the first part of Lord of the Rings. And oh, will so... you be getting a second part? No. <laughs> well, you do. You, you, you did. did. Rankin Bass version. Which yes. Is, I mean, I loved Rankin Bass. I <laughs> did. But that is garbage. It is hot garbage. I will say, though, that the Hobbit animated film is great. No, it is. Yes, it is. I will it fight is you. Really hot. <laughs> I mean, it's not. I mean, okay, the films themselves are not great, but where else do you see a small, weirdly proportioned man-boy thing go absolutely nuts because he's left his handkerchief at home and have a uh, an entire film of Vietnam flashbacks because he doesn't have a handkerchief? Every time because... I look into the mirror, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that I can knock that out. I of like my work. handkerchiefs. I'm proud that you didn't knock things out on the way to work. That would. <laughs> It's never a good thing. Never a good thing. So, um, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping first before we start getting into things. You may notice as this episode rolls on, we are taking a bit of a format change. When we first started doing the Fluff and Hammer, all oh, those seven years ago, well, eight years ago now. Yeah, eight years, yeah. Um, one of the things we were doing, we were doing topics. Um, we were doing all sorts of things. We tried lots of things. Uh, for the first 10 episodes, we had a pub quiz at the end of the show. Ah, I remember that. Yeah. 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 Um, these things kind of got left by the wayside around about 2020. Can't think why. Can't think what happened yeah. there. Um, There's nothing and, significant happening then. The, well, I think the Backstreet Boys had a reunion tour, but that's as far as I can hearing remember. Mm -hmm. Remember hearing that. Lots uh, of people got tickets, right? Lots of people yeah, got tickets. Yeah. Uh, oh, and that just made me watch Backstreet's Back All Right on constant repeat because that song fucking slaps. I don't care what anyone says. Everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rock your body. Yeah. Actually, Andy's in the right format for that song. He is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we kind of transitioned because of all the streams and everything that we're doing. We transitioned into covering the news and we left topics and, and things like that behind. Um, and because any ship that's worth changing course on takes a little while to change the course, we've decided that it might be an idea to get back to those topics. I think we might... Yeah, it wasn't even conscious, was it, really? It was just no. something that happened, right? It was. It was It was because, well, to be honest, it, it's down to three big reasons on, from my point, point of view. Um, I was working from home because COVID had happened, um, so as a result, we weren't, none of us were really doing much. Um, my son had just been born in the January, uh, mm -hmm. and got very ill. And as a result, I had no time to prepare things anymore. So yeah. there was no research time going in. Um, also, I suppose it was just like Games Workshop chucking out stuff as well, right? I mean, they, well, yeah, they, they, they were doing a stream once every two months, you know. Right, it was, it was hard to keep up with, wasn't it? There was so yeah. much stuff coming. Yeah, um, it was a, a hell of a lot of stuff. And that's kind of what happened. We just ended up doing that for... Uh, <laughs> three years <laughs> yeah. yeah four years um so that's kind of what so we're going to try and get back to doing the topics and things which means we can do a little bit more uh listener participation and you know getting things like that because i think it's more fun um yeah. it also means we've got more of a free and loose conversation yeah. not just hemmed in by the news anymore um yeah. and the like other that. good I thing about this that. is it means i can work on getting a backlog and if i can get a backlog in place then I can just release stuff in every two weeks without fail, and I don't have to stress about trying to get things out and done. Um, I've got the ability to do it now, so that's the plan. As it stands, these things Excellent. will probably change as next week comes along, and I have another stupid idea. Uh, or Games Workshop drop a bomb on us. You know, something happens where they... Actually, have you seen what's going on with the next, like... Is, is it Games Day, the next thing we've got coming up? Yeah, for Warhammer Day, yeah. And it's all chaos, apparently. Mm -hmm. like, like, primarily chaos, which is like... 
Yay! Can't wait. I know what they're going to do. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? I'm not saying that. Yeah. I'm not saying it. No, I know what we they're going to do. Know. We all know. Just know that I will be, for the recording, after that, wearing a very large hat. You'll be doing your best hashut impression, yeah? I will curl my beard. <laughs> through sheer anger. <laughs> Can you actually, like, <laughs> buy a proper Chaos Dwarf hat online? You must be able to, right? Oh, somebody, somebody must have done it somewhere. Yeah. There, there has to be a LARP one. There must be, there must be one, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it would require a lot of scaffolding to work, wouldn't it? Hmm. Hang on, hang on. Let's let's have a look. Um, I mean, they make those giant, um, like comically large Irish hats for like um, St. Patrick's Day, right? You know, the big green yeah, ones absolutely. that go for miles. Yeah, that's true. No hey, last why. Halloween, um, I, I went to a party as the Mad Hatter. I had a massive hat. It was hmm. Crazy. Just Ooh. that modified would actually work really well as a Chaos Dwarf hat. Stick some horns on it or something. You'd be well away. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, no. There's uh, You can get big pointy hats, but you can't get any yeah. that are just the giant tube that goes on your head. Really? That's a shame. Huh. That's a shame. I, I, will, uh, I, will, <laughs> I will ask Abby to measure my head, and I will start. <laughs> just make one, yeah? Yeah, why not, hey? Uh, <laughs> I guess you could sure. start with like a cheap top hat and kind of work off that yeah. as like a base structure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, not, it's not too difficult, actually. No, no, it's not impossible in any way, shape, or form, but uh, it's going to be the greatest show we ever do where I'm sitting like three foot yeah. back so you can see the full hat. The thing you is, for to... the hat to work, you need the beard as well. You really need like the full... It's got enough like, of a beard. It's, it's good enough. Beard. I was thinking you need more some tusks just for that. The tusks too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll do what I can to grow some tusks between now and... I mean, you could get fake ones, but if you could grow them, that's even better. No, I what? I was going to say, if you can grow them, go for it. Just sheer will, I'm just going to be there just with warp dust rubbing them into my gums. Either that, mm. just go boar hunting and get the boars ones. There you go. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of boars... Yeah. Um, something that's very <laughs> boar-based. Me and Abby have decided to go back and start watching Lost again. Oh. Really? I, I I only I only got to the end of the first season before I went. This is shit. I'm not watching it. Okay. <laughs> mystery box, baby. Doesn't matter Ooh. what's at the end of the mystery box. Ooh. <laughs> and I think the major problem I've got with it is it's well, five years too early. If it was five years later, there would be less episodes, <laughs> <laughs> and that instantly would improve it. It's a it's a fascinating experience going back to it. Like how many seasons did it get in the end? Five. <laughs> I thought five it was like seven. I thought no, it was seven as well. Was I'm, I'm happy it is only five, but it feels way longer than that. It feels 26, like it never ended. Twenty six episodes a season. Twenty six. Wow. You know, wow. It's, wow. it's an endurance test then. now to see oh, if we can get to the end. <laughs> That's the thing, though, isn't it? I mean, like when you had the promise of there actually being a proper ending, it was actually kind of fun, but. The uh, knowing what the ending is, mm -hmm. it's like it's just uh, it kills the entire show. It's like the first season thing. as well. They're like, Oh, it's this. It's like, No, no it's not. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah. it is. This yeah, is well. the thing, right? People guessed it either, people either guessed it right, or this is this is what I think the showrunners just didn't know. What, I agree, 100%. What, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Completely. And they just like, you know, they just went with whatever someone said, basically. Oh, let's do this. I attest to the incompetence of J.J. Abrams, and I think that is, like he said it like, um, I don't think it was a TED talk, but it was something, he was, he was selling the idea of the mystery box, and to me that right. just was underlining the case, that it's just the idea of what is in the box, rather than the importance mm -hmm. of what the box, uh, what is yeah. in it, just what does the mm -hmm. person think is inside it, it's the mystery mm -hmm. surrounding it, it's like, oh, you couldn't write yourself yeah. out of a shoebox, J.J., <laughs> <laughs> he fucked up Star Trek, so I'm I'm always going to dislike him as well. I don't know. I, I think his Star Trek films are watchable. It, it was the beginning of the end for Star Trek. <laughs> like his first one's fine. It's a fine action movie to mm -hmm. kind of get people in, yeah. and then it's just downhill from there. I think the third one's better than the second. That's not saying much, but I would agree. It's that's very much a yeah. TV movie. Very like much like um, yeah. insurrection. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's um oh god, insurrection. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. worse, insurrection or nemesis? 
Um, there's some interesting. I'd say insurrection. There's some interesting yeah. ideas that they don't work very well with in Nemesis, but there's some there's some bits in there that you're like, oh, there's something there, and they just fuck it up. But there's oh, there's something there. While uh, <laughs> insurrection is just, we've seen these episodes literally in the TV show, but this is done worse, but on a big budget, mm-hmm. <laughs> longer. Yeah, <laughs> a bigger budget, so it looks nice, but yeah. then it's just silly. Yeah, but it doesn't look that good. It looks no. like paper mache buildings. It's really bad. But, but it looks better than the the TV show at the time. You know, than the TV, yeah. like DS Nine was gone at the time, and it does have a higher budget than that. And they have the CGI space battles, which again look better than yeah. the DS Nine stuff. But then you have yeah. Wolf with a fucking pimple because he's gone through adolescence again because of the stupid planet. You haven't okay. seen you haven't seen Insurrection, have you, George? Oh god, I, I'm not. I'm not invested enough in Star Trek. Yeah, it's, to be honest, that's... it's just not my. How how would you? How do you not? How can you have never seen the amazing sequence which has the line "We have to get this cheese to sick bay"? Which one is that? <laughs> that's in Voyager. <laughs> I don't uh, remember that. <laughs> I never forget. It would I be never... Voyager that did that. <laughs> I, I'll, oh, yeah. ne- I'll <laughs> never forget that Janeway had sex with Paris as lizard people. I'll yep. never forget that. Yep. And they had weird yep. lizard babies, and they never talk about it again for good reason. Everyone always talks about how Next Generation, like the latter half of Next Generation, has this amazing, like, super brilliant storyline that leads into DS9 and you know, how it, it's firing all cylinders. The final season, coming up to the end of Next Generation, there is that fucking episode where they all get turned into the primordial versions of their own species. I like that episode, just, but it's, it's and you weird. And just have <laughs> horny monster wolf just going around trying to... Predator wolf. Buff, yeah, buff everything. It is. Yeah, you have I mean, Frog it, it, Deanna Troy as well in the bathtub. To be yeah. fair, that episode scared me as a kid. You had Barkley who turned into a Spider-Man. That's true, yeah. Which that doesn't make any sense. I, <laughs> no, I can't, I can't remember what the justification was, apart from it looked cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Picard was, slowly uh... turned into a little monkey, which I thought was funny. <laughs> <laughs> He's a little monkey. Oh man, gotta get this cheese to sick bag. <laughs> so, um, oh, okay, hobby wise, <laughs> hobby hobby stuff. Uh, what's everyone been up to recently? I know that uh, George has bought himself a lovely little magazine. I have, I have. I mean, it's oh my god! It's the very first issue of White Dwarf I ever, ever owned as a kid. Issue one seven four. God Almighty! I remember picking it up. I remember picking it up off the shelves of the local co-op and just like it. Just you know, when you're like eight years old and you obsess over things, mm-hmm. and it, yeah, that was this. That was this. I, I must have read this till it fell apart basically yeah uh, this issue i mean th- considering how old this bloody thing is this is in really good nick yeah, second hand white was, dwarves are always in really good condition not I always think, but you know i think there's a lot of people like pick it up read it once and then put it on the shelf yeah. there's, there's not base. a lot of people that just keep going back to it again and again and again i think that's the 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 way off most magazines though like with it with a codex you go back to it a lot because you probably you're probably yeah. using it to play with with a magazine yeah, unless yeah. you're going back for like um a how do you do this art wise or how do you make this thing you're probably not going back to it often i would imagine oh i am <laughs> oh yeah 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 then, i mean there are uh, exceptions you know, but like you're basically you mean normal people don't yeah, you? Yeah. you don't mean like <laughs> like divergent people like me right <laughs> well that's what you're thinking there's about. like kids that will obviously do that there are like yeah. super fans that will do that with specific issues yeah um, yeah mm-hmm. Basically, yeah, no, I was obsessed over this. I really did. It, it was it was the gateway, you know, that Hero Quest Space Crusade and this issue of White Dwarf basically um just got me in. And it was I mean, it looks pretty naff now. I'll be I'll be one hundred percent honest. Like it does look pretty naff what now. Do you but mean the it Elder looks naff? Warwalker, it does, it does. There's no denying it. The Elder War Walker was re-released because it actually had a release before this, didn't it, Adam? Yes. A rogue trader, right? Yeah. Um, but it was re-released at this it point. With re-released and cleaned up. But, <laughs> cleaned but up a little bit. When you said it looked naff, do you mean the models? Or did you mean do you mean the magazine format? Like, sorry. Which, which... No, no, no. I mean, I mean the model is is. Oh, the model. I thought you meant like the, mo- the 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 way the magazine was laid out or something. And no, the no, format. no, no, no. Ah, okay. Oh, yeah, really no. The, yeah, the walker is is um. It's a, walker, it's a design. It's, it's a design. Yeah. Absolutely. I loved it, though. I absolutely 
loved it to bits. And I, I, I you know, pestered my parents to take me to the Games Workshop in Derby, which was not very far away, and pick up, pick me up an Elder Warwalker, which they did, and I got, and it was made of lead, and it fell apart mm. <laughs> you know, before I could paint it properly. <laughs> What do you think is a better that. design? Do you think the Imperial Guard Walker is a better design, or do you think the Eldar one? Because they're effectively the same. The Eldar one. The Eldar one. What makes the Eldar one better? Sleek, sleeker. Mm. What do you mean? The more modern one or this one? No, no. I, I mean, I mean the old one and that one. You know, oh, they oh, came they... out about the same time. I mean, I will always go for this one for sentiment's sake because I think <laughs> it's just spectacular. I mean, it's naff. It's totally naff, but I love it. It's great. <laughs> yeah, but Griff, what do you think? Do you, do you prefer the Imperial know. one or do you like the Eldar one more? It's stupid. The pilot's on the front and he hasn't got any protection at all. It's stupid, but I love it. I think it's great. There was a design aesthetic, and it's one of the things I desperately want to do is talk to one of the any of the sculptors that were around at that time. Because I want to know the reason behind it. Because I, th I think I know what the answer is, but I, I really want to know. And it's anything that has any form of crew has the crew basically on a deck chair with no protection. My guess I is it's that. because that way you can see who's driving it and you can paint yeah. the person. Right. Um, I do recall that in the Eldar Codex, the second at Eldar Codex, the background for these things, they don't have canopies or armor in <laughs> because they have all three olds. Exactly, I have a force field, so... Yeah. And to answer Andy's question, I'm going to go for the Imperial one. I was thinking that. I like the angles on it more. Yeah. It, it looks like something you could shave with. Oh, like, uh, I was thinking it looks like something that was probably initially like a, a carrier, like it would move like boxes or something around and they just mm. uh, stick some guns on it who cares <laughs> we're gonna yeah, die why so why not just throw it it's, out there whatever yeah. <laughs> it's the imperium stick guns on it yeah. skull yeah thing. why not right i love the fact that the land speeder of this time has two guys who are oh, on God. what is basically a rocket powered box yeah on deck chairs with no protection it's and so good all you can hear is just the screams of them as they're trying desperately to hold yeah. on because there's no there's no seat belts they yeah, are right. not fastened into their chairs oh, that bloody miniature as well which is like a block of lead mm -hmm. it's a block of solid lead that you had to put on one of those bloody transparent sticks <laughs> oh brilliance Absolute brilliance. I think the best thing about that land speeder, though, is the fact that uh, symmetry is something that happens to other buildings. Yeah, it's, yeah. Absolutely. It's and like so... aerodynamics as well. How the fuck does that thing fly? Power. <laughs> How does it yes. fly? Just like in Back to the Future, McFly, you can't uh, go on water unless you have power. <laughs> Did the land speeders oh, no. stop working over water? Oh, that's, the most, so. uh, that's the most amazing rule I think I've ever heard. <laughs> Not the orc ones. The orc ones never do. They believe they can float on water, so it's fine. I believe we can fly. We believe we can touch the sky. <laughs> Andy, uh, have, <laughs> have you been up to any uh, any hobby? I got Spice Marine 2, and I've only streamed it once. So oh. I haven't got far through it. No. How are you finding it? Ah, it's good. Yeah, it's very pretty. It's very, very mm. pretty. Uh, it, it, there's actually a bit more of a story to it compared to the first one, which isn't, you know, that's not, that's not saying a lot. Uh, I really <laughs> like how it starts off. You play as a, a death, um, death watch guy, which I thought was really cool. Uh, and then you mm -hmm. unfortunately downgrade your armor to an ultramarine armor, which is a, oh. obviously a <laughs> massive downgrade visually. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the counter parry system at the moment. It's something I feel you got to get used to. Uh, and the yeah. amount of nids on screen is is uh, it's really impressive. There's a lot of uh, tyranids on screen at one time, which you actually interact with rather than you know just being a, a thing that happens in the background. They actually yeah, come yeah, towards yeah. you, and there's a huge swarm of them that you gotta kind of handle at one time, which is really interesting. Yeah, that sounds fun. Already, there's been quite a lot of like weapons. Uh, I've had a melter. There's a standard Primaris bolter. There's a stalker bolter. There is a a close range bolter of some kind there's a pistol a heavy pistol uh chainsaw combat knife um there's been a, a, a um i think a heavy bolter as well just the standard you know mm -hmm. uh, devastator kind of one um i can't remember if i've missed any other weapons but there's a decent amount of weapons but you can only hold two at a time unlike the previous game where you could have uh your pistol your, your bolter and then like two other auxiliary ones so they've limited it down 
Um, I'm not really sure on the game reason why they've done that, but I guess it forces you to kind of mix up what you're using for the situation. Yeah. Simplify the gameplay a little bit, maybe. Maybe, maybe yeah. yeah. And probably to get you into more combat. Yeah, like, yeah. Melee combat, I should say. But yeah, it's really yeah. good. Do we think there's going to be a DLC where you manage to get inside the baby carrier and drive that thing around? They, yeah. ha- they Well, they didn't mention that specifically, but they have mentioned online that they have done uh, exceedingly well. And the game's done pretty well in terms of sales and numbers and uh, uh, mm. you know, n- uh, stuff out there, getting it out there to people. So they're thinking about uh, bigger things than what they were planning to originally, which is good. Oh, excellent. Mm. That's nice. Yeah. That's really cool. It's nice to see a Games Workshop video game doing well. Yeah, it's <laughs> apparently done better than all 29 other Warhammer video games combined. Yeah, that's cool. That, that and it only just came out, so that's kind of impressive. Mm. Oh, there, there was a news story today that Henry Cavill is playing it and enjoys it. And I, as soon as I saw that story, I went, "Why is this a story?" <laughs> uh, Henry Cavill uh, likes Warhammer. Why wouldn't he like Space Marine Two? I was going to say it's almost yeah. And also, he's an inveterate geek. Yeah, this is everything he loves, right? Yeah. it's a video game and Warhammer. Of course, he likes it. Man no, in desert likes water. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> of course, he likes. He tells the story multiple times about how he nearly missed out being Superman because he was doing a raid on World of Warcraft. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. We, we kind of know this shit, man. You know, you don't need to report this shit. People, people <laughs> think it's news story because it's a celebrity. But, so I just kind of oh. looked at him and went, well, okay, yeah, fair enough. It would have been fair much enough. better if Henry Cavill liked Space Marine so much he has now decided to go through the Primaris uh, Rubicon <laughs> himself. It's um, himself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, reappeared at Los Angeles this week as a transhuman. For, forgive me for being selfish, but I would be more impressed if the story was Henry Cavill listens to the Fluff and Hammer. Um, <laughs> oh God, that would be no, that, that would obviously be for very, very selfish reasons, but that would be more and, impressive yeah, to me. Yeah, you know. For me, you know. So Henry, if anybody wants to quote well, that, uh... <laughs> yeah, lie to us. That's okay. No, no, no. Just, just quote Henry Cavill listens to the Fluff and Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Millman. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I'm a reputable British source. I'm dead. Mark, you know. Just, you yeah. know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, well, it's it's how the back of DVD boxes used to work, you know. Absolutely. It's true. Bloody is. You, yeah. you just take the line as verbatim. Verbatim? Verbatim? That's what, that's what the word. Verbatim, no. yeah. Verbatim. As, <laughs> as verbatim and verternium. And oh, verternium sounds like the best. <laughs> you, say that. Ver- you say that stuff, but apparently for the... I, I've just seen the latest Transformers 1 kind of trailer, and it has quotes from people... Who are in the Transformers community rating it, and I'm like, huh. <laughs> yeah. it's, like it's the it's a person from Transmissions. It's a uh, TransformersInfo.net guy from uh, Twitter. <laughs> Intra- okay, fair enough. All right, you know. fair enough. I mean, like you know, target audience, I yeah, suppose. Yeah. Right. Why not? I just really like the idea of somebody quoting Henry Cavill listens to the Fluffenhammer dash Andy Millman, but underneath it says something like co-owner of TF Wiki, <laughs> <laughs> just to get it wrong enough to be annoying. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> oh my God, you now that- like uh, getting Henry as a guest? Bloody hell. Oh, I've tried. I, I have run out of ways of trying to do that. It wow. is I'm no sure he's longer... been pested by a load of people as soon as uh, oh, anyone man. found More out. It's oh, like but he, everyone he's... swarmed him like, well, they're Tyranids, oddly enough. Mm. <laughs> he's just yeah. beating them off like, no, be gone, nerds. I shall not I come on your shitty podcast. Like of what he collects, isn't yeah, it? exactly, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, as for myself, um, how the clan rats? Rats. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> rats. You, say you appropriately swarmed, Adam. Rats. There's there's rats. How many? You... Um. Well, this table over here is covered in rats. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's 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 covered in rats. <laughs> so you, you, um, yeah, not clan rats, just rats, like living rats. <laughs> yeah, rats. <laughs> uh, but I did finish two things. So. You know the Forge World Brood Terror? A brood horror, I should say. Have you seen that thing? Right? Not for years. So, I, it's very mouldery. I don't really want to have much in the way of Clan Mulder. I want to be pure skiri, right? So I decided to make my own brood horror using Clan Skiri oh, wow. technology. Oh, wow. Love so it. That, that is a parasite engine. Oh, I love it. 
And the idea is that this thing just wanders around drilling with its giant walk drill. A lot of that. That's Very phallic fat. area, I will, I will know. Yeah. Purposefully so. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then you know that there's the um, the new thing come out, the brood, what was the brood terror? The new one's the brood horror, which has got yeah. the little guy, right? So Fantastic, once again, it? it's a bit too mouldery, so I didn't want mouldery. So I mm. made... A you mechanical made your own version. Yeah. version. Oh, so cool. So that looks like a battle two... tech. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it's built on the uh, the skeleton of a um, war dog. I was gonna say it's a war dog, isn't it? That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. With a great big translate that big scaven flamer with a uh, rat head I love him. onto it. So yeah, that is uh, that is my big things that I've managed to get completed. Oh, well done, Adam. Those are great. It's good fun. It's so really Skaven, good fun. I mean, like the, the Skaven have really got you again. Yeah, now oh, yeah. they have like, OS properly, yeah? Yeah. I've got um, this idea because, you know, Ikit Claw has reappeared in AOS, and he's just this mm -hmm. ghost that goes around from armor. So what I want to do is I'm going to try and build my um, uh, lord, my claw lord, um, to be just this haunted armor with this spooky warp ghost coming out of him. Oh, nice. Very that's, nice. That's my plan. And then I'll use the uh, the bold, little old bald rat with the demon sword that rules for him. You know so, how um, you can do 3D printing? Have you seen the um, the, the, the model that they use for the storm vermin in uh, Total War Warhammer and they've got it dancing? Mm -hmm. Can you get uh, that model as it's dancing uh, and 3D print that? Because uh, that'd be cool to do uh, as like... Uh, translucent and have the the Skaven ghost dancing around Dickett Claw. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. That would oh be my god, that's cool. an amazing idea. Because it's just like Ikka Claw's just there being like, I'm 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 a warlord, and all the Skaven are just dancing around him like, yeah. I've well, still got some clear <laughs> resin. Yeah. He's thinking. It. He's thinking. Ah. And painting painting mm -hmm. ghosts in translucent wouldn't be too hard. You just kind of slap a like a, a glaze on them or a wash and just, like yeah just water down a contrast yeah. warp down um warp green warp lightning and warp um lightning, and yeah, yeah that, that would be perfect yeah. oh. mm. Mm. i've got to <laughs> without That's getting into too deep too many details yeah. i do have things on my computer that i could possibly use but um you know trying to get the actual pose for that would be very difficult like the really right difficult. dance move yeah or just, yeah. just getting poses um you're getting the t-pose and then having to put them into the poses yourself it, it's not not as easy as just ripping and to be fair changing. you could just but... print uh, rats doing t-poses that would be quite fun <laughs> to say dominance rat dominance just 47 rats just combined into one giant rat lord <laughs> <laughs> You could also then use like some of the T bosing rats and then put them on little crucifixes and have them on a hero's like uh, war truck or like ringing bell. So these are the rats that have failed, so they got crucified and put on the the uh, the bell. Mm -hmm. It's like don't fuck up or you get crucified. Wow, grim. I mean, that's I'm, Gaven, I'm, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. Gaven. Yeah, yeah, right. I do like the idea of doing. I don't have a screaming bell at the moment, so I do like the idea of doing a screaming bell that's just like got. Lots of slaves from other races just pull. You need it, to make you know. your own screaming bell, wouldn't you? Because oh, I'm, I'm going to make my own. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to make my own. I'm going. What I'm going to try and do is find bits of the original, mm. because the the original bell is so original. yeah. The actual bell is um, really nice. So yeah, yeah. And then just kind of work on it from that, um, and just build it up from that, and make my own screaming bell because that's half the fun, really, isn't it? You don't want to just mm. go and buy something when you could lose your hairline trying to make it work yourself <laughs> buy yourself some like lollipop sticks for that wood effect oh, oh under you sweet summer child <laughs> oh you've got them do you see this green <laughs> bag over here yeah yeah oh, right? of course nothing but lollipop sticks <laughs> brilliant every Absolutely time brilliant. every time i go into a cafe i fill my pockets with uh, the swirly sticks you sound like dad am i gonna have lollipops today no no these are for daddy no. I'm not. <laughs> Daddy needs these for rats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, just, just like that. I've got thousands yeah. of them. Literally thousands. Um, <laughs> when I awesome. when I made my um, warp lightning cannons, I used these to bolster it because I made them in two. I made one the correct way, and then I made one uh, using the formation for the plague claw. 
-hmm. Now, the problem with the play claw was because of the, the differences in it, it wasn't stable. So I used 40 of these to build a, a new scaffolding around it. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> Why not? Madness. Madness. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Repurpose it, right? Brilliant yeah. idea. And then I had to build a brand new axles for the wheels underneath. It was no oh good. Yes, <laughs> love it. <laughs> Darren on the thing just says the um, Starbucks in its local area has a, a shortage of stirrers and nobody knows why. <laughs> Mystery solved. <laughs> it's good. These are really good to work with and they're so good to stain. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're brilliant stainers. Um, just a brown Good wash man. over them, I'm guessing, and it just brings yeah. out the wood effect, right? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. You want to do a dry brush as well? That that's you know, yeah, goes well, really well, no. but you don't need to. No. Just stain it <laughs> once and it's absolutely fine. Brilliant stuff. All right, then. Shall we get on to the topic in hand? For we are going to be talking yeah. about fourth ed chaos space marines. The best yeah. one. Oh yeah, by far the best yeah. chaos space marine codex. It's also so, wafer thin. Oh. Yeah, well, it, I mean, to be fair, for codices of this era, that's not too bad. It actually has a fair. It's it's 104 pages, which isn't too bad. Wasn't for this previous, wasn't uh, second edition um, a lot thicker? Oh yeah, second edition yeah. was loads thicker. But then they were the, the second edition books were just friggin' massive. But with the transition to third ed, they started to become very, very, very thin indeed. Like the first third ed books. Uh, it's like there's some terrible. more pages of law in this, and that's yeah, it. It feels like it. They're basically pamphlets. Yeah. yeah. You know. Chaos are bad they're people. Both, they yeah. happened in the Horus Heresy. It's there, is, <laughs> there is stuff in the third edition uh, codexes, which I quite like, and that is that they move yeah. the background from being up front and center, and they move it to being these little outcuts and things. Definitely, yeah. Like, I mean, you've got a picture of the third, the 3.5 codex up there, and that's exactly like that. So rather than having, like, the big blocks of text, it's got, like, little excerpts and things that are in-universe, which is kind of fun. It's a fun way of doing it. I mean, the big problem that happened with the transition from second ed to third ed was that they were starting from scratch again, pretty much. Third mm -hmm. ed was such a drastically different game to oh, yeah. second edition. I mean, like, everything was scrapped, so the, the rules were completely different. The, the, the assumptions of the game were different. And in, in baseline terms, it was, a, it was a good transition. You know, I, I much prefer third ed functionally to, to second ed. Because, I mean, Second Ed is great fun, but it's a mess. Mm -hmm. It's a freaking mess. So you've got things like, in Second Ed, the vehicle rules basically are another set of rules that are bolted onto the main rule section. The vehicle rules so in Second Ed are their own game. I've yeah, always said totally it. Yeah, they are totally their own game. And figuring out how vehicles work in Second Ed is a nightmare. It's a complete nightmare. Whereas in third ed, it's all integrated. It's all integrated into the main rules. Psychic, psychic stuff is the same. In second ed, you had uh, Dark Millennium, which fl mm. it filled out the psychic phase. But the psychic stuff is an entire game system in and of itself. If you've got yeah. psychers, when the psychic phase rolls around, suddenly the game just stops. And you've got to like get your cards out and figure out what psychic can do what, how many lot, how much power they have, or, and oh my god, it's a nightmare. Third ed, they refined it all down. So psychers are just characters with with weapons, effectively. Mm -hmm. Psychic powers function like weapons. The big problem they had is that because they were trying to rush everything out of the gate so quickly, because of course everything was invalidated with the shift from second ed to third ed. All the codices were completely invalidated. Yeah. They were trying to get as many codices out as possible. So like every month after Third Ed hit, there was a codex. Every mm -hmm. month there was a codex. So you had the Space Marines, you had the Dark Elder, you had the Chaos Space Marines, and that's the first Third Ed Chaos Space Marine codex. Not this one that you've got up, the other one, the previous yeah. one. And the problems with them is because they were trying to rush them out, they're not very good. Like no. functionally, they're not very good. So, like, the third Ed Chaos Space Marine Codex had a lot wrong with it. It had so much wrong with it that the month it came out, there was an errata in White Dwarf putting, like, a page full of stuff, mm -hmm. putting things right that they'd either missed out or that just didn't work. A really good example. It was The, the article, I, I'll always remember because it's called 
putting the zap back into Zeech. Zap's <laughs> <over> the, <laughs> the reason being, they'd actually the army list is so rushed that there's inconsistencies in it. So you can take a, a demon prince, right? And the demon prince can have psychic powers, which in this edition function like weapons. Okay, so you have to roll to hit with your ballistic skill like you would with a fired weapon, right? Yeah. Demon princes had a ballistic skill of zero. So mm -hmm. that you could give them a psychic power, but they couldn't hit anything with it. No. Literally couldn't hit anything with it. If you had a ballistic skill of zero, you couldn't roll any number to hit anything. It didn't, you just couldn't hit anything. No, you're not so on the had, charge. It was, that, yeah. it was that kind of thing. You had a situation where chaos lords, who had a, like a mark of chaos, they could join, like, so, say you had a chaos lord with a mark of corn. Yeah. They could join a unit of corn berserkers, but they didn't have the same rules as the corn berserkers. So the corn berserkers were fearless, right? The chaos lord wasn't. So the chaos lord could run away, but mm -hmm. the corn berserkers, it was that kind of thing. There was loads and loads and loads of problems with the third Ed Chaos Space Marine Codex, the original one, as there was with all of those early third Ed codices. Do you remember the Elder one? Oh, yes. Everybody remembers the Elder One from that era because it was goddamn ridiculous. It dominated that entire edition. It was so ridiculously powerful, people started to refuse to play against certain armies. Mm -hmm. But what they started to do about halfway through Third Ed was update or even completely replace the codices. With, and they did so with an eye towards like an actual philosophy rather than just like, oh, we've got to get stuff out as quickly as possible, they really sat down and thought, like, what are these armies? How do they function? What, what feeling do we want them to convey? And on the back of that, you got this. This is, I mean, this is the 3.5 Codex. And you, you've heard mm -hmm. me talk about this before many times, either here or in the Fluff and Hammer adjacent. Go online, type, go onto YouTube, type in <laughs> Air Space Marine Codex 3.5, and watch the videos, the endless videos of people just rhapsodizing about this codex. And mm -hmm. I mean, like, utterly rhapsodizing about this codex because it's one of the best books Games Workshop have ever put out. It is just one of the very best books Games Workshop have ever put out. And what makes it so good is it's just so various. It is complex. There's a lot of stuff in here. There's a lot of caveats. There's a lot of like things like types of war gear, like there's demonic gifts that function differently from normal war gear. There's God-specific demonic gifts. There's marks of chaos. There are veteran skills, veteran skills that you can apply to individual Chaos Space Marine units to reflect the fact that these guys have been fighting in the Eye of Terror for X amount of thousands of years. And yeah, it's really complex, but it's so much fun. Just building armies from this book is, is it, it's, it's a game in and of itself. Each of the Chaos Gods has their own mini book in this. There's the Book of Slanesh that has its own artwork mm -hmm. and its own background, and it has its own marks and armory and psychic powers and minor psychic powers and special psychic powers. On top of that, for the first time, you get specific army lists in a codex for the different Undivided Legions. Yep. You get the Night Lords. And th these are basically based on the um, the Index Astart is it the Index Astart Index Hereticus articles yes, that yeah. they did. They're like simplified versions of them. So you've got the base army list, which is really various. You can do all sorts of things with it. Then you've got the undivided legion army lists, mm -hmm. which are really interesting. Then you've got the god specific army lists, which have got so much detail. And yeah, it's it has problems because there's so much stuff in it. It's internally imbalanced. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you remember these guys from this edition? The anyone Iron who Warriors. was playing in third edition? Does anyone remember the Iron Warriors list that were I, bloody everywhere? I do. That was the point when the Iron Warriors became famous <laughs> yeah because... absolutely you had like you had gray mcneil's storm of iron coming yeah. out you really sold the iron warriors but you also had that army list and that army list just dominated 
Yeah. It absolutely dominated. What made it so good is that you had the, the force organization chart in this version of 40k. Um, so you could only take like cer- in most games you could only take certain numbers of certain kinds of units. So like certain numbers of elites, certain numbers of heavy support, certain numbers of fast attack, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Iron Warriors could do this thing where they could swap like fast attack and troops choices for heavy support. Mm-hmm. So you could have a load of different heavy support units all at once in an Iron Warriors army. Demolishers. So demolishers you could have um uh defilers you could have obliterators have you know all those kinds of things havocs mm-hmm. all those kinds of things and it just made them really powerful it made them a really really powerful army they dominated for the longest time what people love about it though isn't necessarily the power level what people loved is the fact that it this is a love letter to fans it's just a love letter to fans of chaos People didn't like the original 3 point, 3.0 codex. They didn't like it. And they were quite no. vocal about the fact they didn't like it. You know, online, if you went on the forums back then, it was all over the place. It wasn't really well received. This put it all right, basically. People went nuts. They went absolutely nuts for this book. Like, if you went to a games workshop or if you went to a tournament or anything like that, every other army during this period would be a chaos army. Mm-hmm. every other army because you can make every every different type of army in this book plays differently it's like a book that's filled with umpteen hundred different army lists yeah. that's what's so good about it it's mutable you can do pretty much what you like with this codex and it actively encourages you to tailor your army to make it narrative so you've got things like the chosen entry right in this book, you don't have an, a separate entry for Chosen and Terminators. Chaos Terminators and Chosen are all rolled into this one entry, the Chosen. And you can upgrade any number of them to characters. They can all be aspiring champions, which then have access to all of like the demonic rewards and the armory and the demon weapons. You can upgrade one of them to a Psyker. So this is like... It's like the Chaos Lord's retinue in the background, you know, that's all full of different types of characters that Mm -hmm. you can tailor, you can model, you can write the background for. That's what did it. The people loved this book. They absolutely loved it. A problem with it was it was so good, it made most of the other codices that were available at the time look terrible. I mean, really lackluster. And that was a real problem. That was a real problem because people, obviously people were a little bit, you know, were a little bit jealous of it, but rather than taking this format and making all of the other codices better, when fourth ed rolled around, they didn't. Instead, they jettisoned everything. And I mean, everything, all that was good. I mean, this, this book needed, it did need work. There's no doubt it needed tempering. Yeah. So some of the more abusable elements needed to be toned down. Some, the, the Iron Warriors army list kind of needed to be toned down. The Emperor's Children army list kind of needed to be toned down a little bit. The availability of like certain demonic rewards kind of needed to be toned down. But that is just a balancing issue. What they should have done was take this format and just refined it a little bit, right? Just just tweaked it a little bit, limited the number of demonic rewards you could take for any one character, stuff like that just balanced out the variant army lists and everything would have been good. They didn't, unfortunately. What they did no. was they jettisoned it completely. They just chucked it out completely. And the the result was this. Do you guys remember the reaction to this? Yes. Do we I remember around the... I, 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 now, I was coming out of it now because 4th Ed would have been my... Jumping off point. Yeah, me um, too. The, yeah. <laughs> and that, a lot of that had to do with, I didn't... I need to frame this a little bit here, I think. Um, Rogue Trader, we know what Rogue Trader is. Rogue Trader was a game that was never meant to have two people playing. It was meant to be two people and a DM. A it DM, is an RPG yeah. game played on a tabletop. That's what Rogue Trader is built to be. Yeah. 
It may be an army that you've got, but it, that's what it's built to be. Second, Ed gets rid of the RPG, and the system that it has is a very complex series of systems that are all running in tandem. And when they moved it to third and streamlined it, and I will say third is a much, much better system for its time, mm -hmm. but it lacks because the codices at the time were fucking terrible. They were, but well, all Just, of those early codices had to be redone, all of them. The, the Tyranid Every Codex one, is but... shite. It's yeah. utter shite. Um, the Dark Elder Codex, they were the new army. Remember, the Dark Elder were introduced yep. for third ed, but they mm -hmm. had to redo that codex halfway through, so you got like a 2.0 version of that yes. codex. Yeah, I remember. Oh, I remember. Because um, it was bad. And so when Time Fourth ran around, that was my point of like going, I think I'm done, I'm going to jump off here. Yeah. Um, I, I think Fourth is a really good system. I think Fourth is a really good system and it has some very good codices. It's really but, good. Like the, yeah. the base game of Fourth Ed is actually really good. There's some really mm -hmm. lovely things in it. But at the, at the time, I was exhausted with Third Ed. Third Ed wiped out my love of 40k that I that built up over Second Ed. Um, I stayed on a little bit with Mordheim and Fantasy Battle, but not for much too. Maybe about another year, year and a half, something like that. Um, by about 2002, I was out. I was done. Mm -hmm. 2002, 2003. Um, then I had a little... A little bit coming back in around about 2007 for a little bit and then yeah. came out again. Because um, Fancy Battle was a fucking mess in 2007. Uh <laughs> it really was. So I come back to it and Fourth Ed is a much, much better system than I ever gave it credit for and the codexes are much, much better. Third Ed is a really good system with shite codex. And it's a really funny thing now. AOS just did the same thing third ed 40k did the only difference being they released these shitty codexes for free online for you as gets you by mm. and that's i think the bit that sticks in my craw when it comes to third what they released was never fit for purpose it should have been one book with everything in as it gets you by whilst they got round to making the codexes properly because they are yeah. rushed they are tiny yeah. Those early ones definitely are. They definitely the first two, are. the first year, if not going into the second year, you know that those codexes are really bad. They're so inconsistent as well. The problem hmm. is the formats are all over the place. Like every new one is a different format. It's its own entity, and the the power differential between them is insane. It's absolutely mm -hmm. insane. The Space Marine one is really lackluster. The the Dark Elder one is abjectly terrible. I mean, they just don't function in the, the first one. It just doesn't function. It's not very good at They're all. They're meant to be a glass cannon, right? Right, um, but it doesn't work, right? No, because you can shoot off the Dark Elder army with anything. Yeah, they're, they're so <laughs> fragile. But then the, the, the Craft World Elder come along, and they obliterate all comers, like mm -hmm. everyone. Um, but they did start to get it right with with yes. you know with this they started to towards the like the midpoint they started to get it right and when this thing came around in fourth ed I I remember what it was like online because people had started to get rumblings of what this was and everyone was beyond anything else everyone was confused. Like, the enthusiasm for the 3.5 Codex was still riding high. This was still a very good Codex in 4th Ed. It translated very well into 4th Ed, this did. Mm -hmm. And then this came along, and people started to hear that they've taken everything away. So all of the options, all of the uh, appendix army lists, the Books of Chaos for the Chaos Gods, the Legion-specific army lists, gone. Veteran skills, gone. The Demonic Gifts, gone. And people were like, nah, nah, that's, that's not right. Of, co they, of course they wouldn't do that. Oh, you also can't take demons, by the way. Um, demons are now going to be in a separate codex. Um, and people were like, nah, they'll never do that. And, this, <laughs> you know, and I'm telling you, this was, for me, certainly, but I think also culturally speaking, this, it's a marker of the darkest period of Games Workshop, which is when they, there was this real corporate push in the game to try and force players to collect yeah. armies in a particular way. So Agreed. 
what they what they tried to say about this codex was, oh, we're trying to simplify everything. We're trying to make it more streamlined so that you can just pick up and play, yeah? I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. That's absolute bullshit. What they were trying to do was force you to force players to collect armies in a particular way, in a way that they didn't want. So they separated for the first time ever, by the way, they separated Chaos Space Marines from demons. So for the first time, you've got two codices, Chaos Demons and Chaos Space Marines. And in order to play your Chaos Demons, you may have been collecting like Chaos Demons alongside your Chaos Space Marines for since Rogue Trader, right? Since Rogue Trader. And you will have paint like, like say, let's say you had a Death Guard army. So you will have painstakingly modeled or painted your Plague Bearers and your Great Unclean Ones and your Nurglings to fight alongside your Plague Marines. You can't do it anymore. In this codex, you can't do it anymore. Um, in order to play them as great unclean ones, plague bearers, nurgling, you've got to go and collect an entirely separate demon army. And of course, chaos players were like, fuck that. You can't do it. <laughs> the vast majority of, of chaos space marine players just stop at this point. All of the goodwill that had been built up with this, I mean, under this codex, you had players collecting multiple different chaos armies. I did. I had a, a Word Bearers army, an Emperor's Children army, a Death Guard army, and a Thousand Sons army at this point. Because you could Much like current day then as well. <laughs> very much like the present day. Yes, they're on that shelf back there. <laughs> uh, very much like the present day. It, and they just threw that out and gave us this. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know how they couldn't have understood what the reaction to this book was going to be. And it was way more profound than even they thought. And you can tell because the format they introduced in this book and with one other that was released concurrently, which was the Dark Angels Codex, stopped immediately. The codices that came after this and the Dark Angels book are completely different. Yep. completely different that minimalist thing they're going for with this where everything is torn out it's gone it's gone so that leaves this and the dark angels codex in this weird no man's land where this format only exists here so you can imagine chaos players were just righteously pissed off righteously pissed off not only had all of that role-playing narrative stuff, that feeling in essence from the 3.5 codex gone, but we were left with a codex that was alone in this format. Perhaps if all the others had followed suit, it wouldn't have been so bad, but they didn't. No. No, we, what you've got here is a games workshop that is desperately trying to work out its identity. It was Ansel still in charge. Um, and he is trying desperately to work out, are you a miniatures company or are you a game company? Are right. you selling games to sell the miniatures or are you selling miniatures to sell the games? And I think what happens round about this period of time, which would be 2003, I want to say... No, later than that, be 2000. Oh, this, this is much later than that. Yeah, this 2007, is... wouldn't it be 2007? 2007, yeah, well yeah. done, Adam, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my God, my brain, it hurts. Yeah, um, yeah you have the, whilst well, Games Workshop has been a company that makes the games, makes everything, everything is there to sell the miniatures. This laser points forth ed and round about this time, and it's what kills Fantasy Battle, basically, is that laser focus on we will sell you these miniatures so you can yeah. play this army in this game. That's that's exactly the thing with this book. They've got this whole, this is like a bee in their bonnet about design in this book where they want everything to be represented in the miniatures. They have this thing about invisible rules, things like the marks of chaos, you know, which traditionally you can't always actually see on the miniature, no. depending on how they're represented. Here, there's this, bloody stupid system introduced where if you want to give a unit a mark of chaos you need to give them an icon of chaos so the icon of their chaos god one of the miniatures has to be carrying the the icon the standard of of zeech or corn or whatever in which instance the unit gets the mark so they get the yeah. bonus right so you can see it in the unit fair enough not necessarily a bad thing 
not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the way it's implemented. So if the model carrying the magic stick is killed, the unit loses the mark. Yeah, the unit doesn't have the mark. The one minute she does, what you see is what you get. How does that make sense? Uh, It makes sense because it's tournament. That that does not make any sense. So you're telling me that this unit, these Chaos Space Marines that are dedicated to corn, that are frothing lunatics, because one of their number drops a stick, they stop being that. Yeah. (laughs) It's stupid. It's just really badly implemented and really badly designed. On top of that, it's the inconsistencies. It's Again, it's not a power thing either. Do, do you remember the very famous army list from this codex that was actively banned from several tournaments? I don't. It was called the Dual Lash Plague Marine Obliterator list. Oh, and shit, yes. Do you remember that? Yes. So what you, what you would take is two demon princes of Slanesh with the psychic power, the Lash of Submission... In your troops, you would take two units of Plague Marines, and in your heavy support, you would take two units of Obliterators, and the rest you would just take Chaff, because that army list was the most abusable thing in existence. The psychic power, Lash of Submission, which is the Slanesh psychic power, is broken. Yeah. It is one of the most broken psychic powers, not only in this edition of the game, but in any edition of the game I've ever seen. It's ridiculous. So the way it works is, the target basically, um, a psycho may use the psychic power in the shooting phase instead of using another ranged weapon. Pick any non vehicle enemy unit visible to the psycho and within 24 inches, and then take a psychic test in order to use the power. So it's a demon prince taking the psychic test. So it's a leadership test. So it's really easy to pass. Like mm-hmm. they'll almost always auto pass it, right? Very rare that they'll fail. If the test is successful, the target is moved two die six inches by the chaos player. The Chaos player can actively move enemy units up to two die six inches. I, if you've ever played any edition of the game, that is so ridiculously powerful. And if you can do that multiple times per turn, it's insane. It's yeah. a good example of how this book wasn't playtested, like at all. It wasn't playtested. There's no way that would have gotten through if if there were any playtesting at all. It's internally inconsistent because it is the most powerful psychic power. There's no reason why you would take any of the others over that. No. no and as no. a result, that army list, the Dual Lash Plague Marine Obliterator list, was banned in many, many competitive scenes because it's ridiculous. It's utterly, utterly ridiculous. So it's not about power. That's the argument that a lot of people often make when they're trying to defend this book. Oh, you just don't like it because this thing was so abusable and you want the power back. No, it's not that. It's not about that. It's about flavor. It's about feeling. It's about the the narrative consistency of the army. This is boring. That's the big thing with this book. It is dull as dishwater. You know how I was saying putting together army lists from this is really fun. It's like mm-hmm. a game in and of itself. You can go through and see like what combinations you can create, what monstrosities with demonic gifts and like demon weapons and things you can create. You can't do that here. There are there is a standard entry for everything, and almost every option for everything has been ripped away. When you see it in the army list, that's what it is. That's how it works. That's how it functions. Chaos Lords, for example, like the only weapon options they really have are you can give them the demon weapon of their their god. That's about it. Yeah. And even they're inconsistent. You're never going to go for any of them except the Bliss Giver, the Slanesh one again, because the Bliss Giver is the best one. I mean, the the big thing I'm always going to say about this edition is obliterators. Yeah, Um, right. Yeah, the (laughs) shit miniature that was horrendously overpowered. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. they did everything in their power to sell you the obliterators and people didn't buy them. This is a, something I do remember very well. Anybody who had obliterators would just do some custom work on a Terminator mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. rather than buy the actual obliterator because the obliterator was shit. It was, yeah. it was fucking awful. It was it's a horrible miniature. 
it's only recently with those obliterators that came in one of the box sets that now have a separate release they had a, they've got a decent miniature yeah yeah i mean the, you look at the obliterator cult uh, rules you've got um you know number of squad one to three war gear a single power fist obliterator yeah. weapons once per turn turns from last cannon uh, that's the, that's the 3.5 version and that's brilliant they're actually really good in that version and also they're limited to oh to o, zero to one so that means you can only take one unit of them so yeah they're really powerful yeah. but in most army lists you can only take one unit of them it's really clever right yeah yeah I know, if i remember correctly iron warriors don't have that limitation so I don't no. know. <laughs> uh, yeah but in this one, the 4.0 Codex, again, they're pretty goddamn powerful. They are pretty goddamn powerful. And taking two units of them, you know, with backing up Plague Marines, backing up Dual Lash Demon Princes, it's it's pretty mental. It's pretty mental, I've got to say. And it's, it, you know, I don't want to be too harsh on this because there are good things in this book. I know not many people say it, but there are good things. The good stuff is the background. The good yes. stuff is the background. There is this massive, massive section at the front because the army list is so bare bones that they've got space to just go nuts with the background. And what they do, I think, is really interesting. A lot of people didn't like this, but I, I kind of liked it. They move the focus away slightly from the original traitor legions. They're in here, but they mm -hmm. move it more towards like war bands of chaos. Yeah. So they take, and I, I really like this. A lot of people didn't, and I, I totally take that. But they take like the assumption that, okay, the traitor legions have been fighting for 10,000 years. How much has culture changed in only 2,000 years? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So. How diversified would they be now? How much different would they be from what they used to be? So they move it towards like these renegade war bands and these, these schemes and forms that are slightly removed from the traitor legions. And they're trying to encourage people to come up with their own schemes and their own background. I love that. I think that's really cool. I think that diversifies chaos. I think that gives it a lot of flair and flavor and it encourages creativity, but it's not backed up by the army list because the army list forces you down these very narrow roads because there are competitive choices and non-competitive choices. There are choices you're going to take and choices you're not. And there's no customization in the army list. And that's the, that's the big inconsistency in this codex. That's the big problem. Oh, well, no, the biggest problem is that Doom Rider's not in it. Um, no, 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 he isn't. No, he isn't. <laughs> but, I mean, Although I will say this, this is the first codex where Iron Man remembered to turn on his the force aspect of his staff. Yeah, true. In, in all previous versions, for some reason, the black staff wasn't a force weapon. No. It's like, why? It was a stick. <laughs> it was a stick, yeah. <laughs> I think... There's a lot to be said about, right, so let, we'll break this into two parts. The, there's the rules, which we've kind of covered and mm. how you build a, an army and everything and how um, within 4th Ed's rules, this is a really badly put together force, which is yeah. a shame because the guys who make it are you know, two of the big names of that era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a really weird one. You've got Gav Thorpe and... Um, I'm going to, should I try and pronounce his name? Because I'm going to make a mess of it. It was Alessio Capital, wasn't it? Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Alessio for... Capital, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for saying it, so I didn't embarrass you know, myself. Uh, yeah, they are veterans of, of rules design and games design. It's really bizarre that this misses the mark so badly. Because it, all they would have needed to do is go onto any of the 40k forums that were active at the time. And they would have known that this this wouldn't have hit well. They'd have known. This is not what Chaos players wanted. Um, and it makes me feel the way, uh, given that also, what else was going on at this time, guys? Do you remember in 40K? What was the big push in 40K around this time? The 13th Black Crusade? Nope. Apocalypse. <laughs> Oh, shit, and yes. I think that's what this is about. I think the reason this is so simplified is because they were getting, you know, pressure from above. We we need to sell Apocalypse. It's big armies. We'll sell loads of miniatures. Make the codices simpler so people can take these big armies, you know, without having to mess about with this and that. 
That mm-hmm. was the imperative. And of course it didn't work because what's happened to Apocalypse, they've effectively jettisoned it because it yeah. wasn't popular. Well, they kind of reworked it and put it into Horus Heresy because Horus Heresy yeah. is now like the, the big Heresy. mass. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, in, in 40k, I don't actually know anybody who played Apocalypse Rules. Well, the thing is, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad idea, but how do you it's how do you do it? It's so difficult to organize. It, you need the space for it, you need the time, you need like the miniatures collection, you need it's it's just a nightmare, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Andy. Yes. <laughs> At this point in time, were you completely out of yeah, Warhammer? Completely yeah, completely out. Yeah. Uh, it, it's an interesting one to me because because this is kind of my drum, my big jumping off point until yeah. 2017. Um, yeah. You know, this era is when I kind of stop being into Warhammer and kind of go back to Transformers. Mm. <laughs> And it, it's an interesting one, personally, because it's almost like this was so poor. Yeah. Well, it, it, it wasn't just this. It was a lot of things. I think I'd, I'd spent a long time in 40K that it, I kind of just went, I'm going back even further now, and I'm going to uh, <laughs> go back to my original big love. And it, it's weird to me that I've kind of come out of the, the Transformers stuff and gone straight back into Warhammer. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because like it's there's like historical stuff going on here. I mean, the Fluff and Hammer came about because of the way Games Workshop changed, the way it pulled itself back from the the depths that were created from this era. Yeah, I mean um, that's just, that's I think a big thing to to kind of discuss is that this is Games Workshop turning its back on the people who were who had made it big. Yeah, and they were just trying to mine them for everything that they were worth. Uh, um, the thing is, people knew as well. Oh, if you, yeah, again, yeah. You go to the forums. I mean, the posts obviously they still exist in some of the forums. You go to like Daka Daka or Bolter and Jane mm-hmm. Sword or whatever. They still exist. These historical archive posts where people are talking about this and the Demon Codex, and they point it out. They say they're trying to force us to play and collect in a way we don't want to play and collect. You know. They and they know they're doing it. They know they're doing it. It's all corporate. It's all corporate. They're trying to force us to collect bigger armies, uh, to collect two or more armies, uh, you know, which we don't want. We just don't want. And that's when you get the jumping off. That's when you get people saying, "Well, I'm, I'll, 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 I'll maybe keep my Orion, you know, keep an eye on the background and all that kind of thing." But I'm not collecting anymore, or no. I'm not playing anymore. I mean, that was me. That was me when this came out. I, I jumped ship. I jumped yeah. ship. I tried yeah. actually, I, and I will say I tried with this. Uh, me, I remember having a couple of games with this book with my regular gaming partner Graham, and just like you played a couple of games with it, and you were done. Mm-hmm. You were just done. It was so dull. It was so goddamn boring playing with this book. As I say, it's a shame because I do think Fourth Ed is a really good rule set. Mm-hmm. It's a solid, solid rule set. It's just yeah. that you know. They weren't hiding the fact they were trying to sell you miniatures anymore. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and they were you know, aggressively trying to get you into doing stuff. And there's yeah. there's so much in this book which blows my mind. I mean, you've got these pages upon pages of all these different um, chapters that you can you can get into, like everything from the Lords of Decay, yeah, <laughs> the Night Lords just kicking around in there in this like yeah, yeah. group of unknowable shitty <laughs> little chaos chapters and it's mean- this is the stuff, right? I love that. And also, this is new, right? Yeah. All this stuff where they've introduced like the, the little renegade chapters and the little warbands, it's new. For the first yeah. time, they're not just recycling the background from Second Head, which is what pretty much every codex up until this point did. And that's brilliant. I mean, I that's the that's the ambiguity of it, right? I love the fact that they did that. And also, this book has a really interesting section where it talks about the psychology of a chaos space marine. It goes into real detail about mm-hmm. what happens to a chaos marine, or rather to a, a space marine, when the psycho-indoctrination starts to break. And they start to realize, hang on, this is bullshit, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm being used, basically. I'm a, I'm a weapon for this hypocritical, theocratic, fascist empire. 
and they break down. They they have these dark nights of the soul where they lose everything, like all everything that they were conditioned to believe, everything they were remade to believe is ashes. Mm-hmm. And from that, that's where they start to rebuild themselves, some sense of their identity. And that's what usually leads them into the arms of chaos or into becoming like renegades or whatnot. That was this is really the first time. It's the first book to really go into that kind of detail about that kind of thing. It's just such a shame that like you've got all this on the one hand, you've got this incredible quality in the background. And then you've got the army list. And the army yeah. list is just so bad. It is I I would go out on a limb and say it's probably the worst army list they've ever made. I would go out on a limb. I think mm. it's really awful. I mean, like genuinely frigging awful. I mean, I'd be hard pressed to argue that. Um... Well, I mean, really, it, it's Six hard to good. argue with because it jettisons so many people from the game. Yeah, from yeah, the hobby, that's true. You know? Yeah, it, it's interesting to me. I mean. I'm wondering how many people who listen to this, and if you do listen to this and mm-hmm. uh, this did happen to you, how many people jumped off at fourth? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just just generally. Yeah, you don't have to be a yeah. chaos player. But I want to know that how many people jumped off, jumped off at that fourth. That would be interesting. How many I mean, people got in at fourth? You know, that's... there was yeah, and there was good stuff happening in fourth. Was it in fourth that the Dark Elder had their big renaissance? Where they were like, compl- they had their new codex, and they were completely like their at- their background was rewritten, their aesthetic yeah. was changed. That was brilliant. It was Phil Kelly who did that, wasn't it? It was, yeah. That was brilliant. Good old Phil Kelly. Yeah, Phil Kelly, right? That was awesome. That that codex that rejigged the Dark Elder slightly and made them more like Cenobites, basically. That's what it did. It made them into yeah. science fiction Cenobites. That's a really good book. It's a really, really good book. But again, it really does demonstrate the disparity, right? The way each there's no standardized format for these things. No. So each codex is a fucking experiment, which means inevitably you've got good ones and you've got bad ones. You've got ones that work and ones that don't, ones that have got this design philosophy, ones that have got that design philosophy. It's very irritating. <laughs> I'm trying to think, is this the era of the Matt Ward Ultramarines book, or does that come later? Yeah, I'm just trying to I remember. Think it is. Is it, I think it is 4th Ed, isn't it, guys? Chat, do you know? Is it 4th Ed or is it 5th Ed? I've got a funny feeling it's late 4th Ed, you know. Yeah, I think you might be right. It definitely wasn't out when I came out of 40K. Mm. Um, I came back to that after the fact, but... I'm just trying to remember. Do I, remember I do the- remember it. I do remember it. And again, it was mm, it was naff. <laughs> it was really naff. I remember. So it do remember- really weird, again, it, 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 that book had this really weird thing where, in order to make a chapter like an army, a particular chapter, you you were forced to take a particular character. It it was just mm-hmm. weird. It was weird the way it worked. Again, it's this locking in the rules to the miniatures, you know, which never works. It never works. If you're forced to do shit like that, it just makes making the army list boring. Yes. Um, (laughs) I've gone down a rabbit hole here. I'm trying to find... Oh, my word, it still exists. Holy crap. So in the early t- mid 2000s, right, that was my forum back then. Mm. And I've discovered it still exists. Um, unfortunately, none of my posts seem to have survived, <laughs> uh, which is a bit of a shame because what I was trying to find there was my, when I bought the Tyranid book. Uh... Um, because I remember the Tyranid book at this era being both amazing yeah. and absolute knackers. It, it was, was a step up was, from the third ed one, because the third ed one is a, is a freaking pamphlet with barely anything in it, and it's mm-hmm. awful. And I, There's a lot of stuff you could use from the third ed one, but it was so 
coolly put together. It was very hard to work it out. The fourth ed one had tons of customization. Yeah. Like no. there was so much customization, you could do anything. Yeah, you could do really oh, wild good. things, couldn't you? Like putting venom yep. cannons on gene stealers and stuff like yep. it was crazy, right? Biomorphs just everywhere. Yeah, which in a lot of ways is the exact opposite of this book of the the chaos. Uh, right, chaos right. It it's is... much closer to this. Yeah, it's much closer to this design philosophy, right? Yeah, so it's a really weird one. So that makes me wonder: Did they just assume that tyranny players weren't going to be playing Apocalypse? Right, right. Because a Tyranid army in Apocalypse using that codex would have been insane. Yeah. To organize, it would have been a nightmare. So you'd have to sit there like and think think about how big Tyranid units were if you're taking like a swarm style army back then. You'd have to sit there thinking, like, so who's got this biomorph? Who's got the, the venom cannon biomorph? Which oh my god, nightmare. Yeah. Uh, the the Matt Ward one was uh fifth ed, I think. So that would mean that this one would be the Space Marines one. The Ultramarines are full on there as the quintessential Space Marine chapter, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they're not. Oh, like I'm, I'm with you, the, super best one. The, the one, the other uh, demonettes that are up on the screen now, they're the best. They are the best <laughs> demonettes. Definitely. Oh, Andy, good. Well, good I love them. Good find. I love, That's, them. Uh, I love those demonettes. Mm hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I tell you what, the current ones need replacing. The current ones, because you know, funnily enough, the current lot of demons across the range. You know, the uh, the certainly the um, the 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 troop demons, your plague bearers, your blood letters, your demonettes, and your pink horrors. They're from this era. They came yeah. out alongside the demon codex that was the sister codex to this. Ah, of course. So, and they've been in in use in both AOS and 40k ever since then. So they need replacing. Seriously. <laughs> Here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. What out of the fourth ed Chaos Codex book mm -hmm. would you keep in a modern day setting? I would the background primarily. All okay. of this stuff. The diversified stuff, where they talk about how the the traitor legions do still exist, and they mm -hmm. are still organized forces, but there are loads of schisms and splinters, and there are loads of like individual war bands that are broken away from them, and they form their own little cults and their own little like traditions. That I would keep the background on the renegade chapters uh, and the encouragement that this book has to customize you know on a hobby on the hobby side of things to create your own livery and your own names and your own background that i would keep that mm -hmm. i would definitely keep. the army list nothing i mean literally nothing it's so badly put together i would keep nothing from the army list i would this is the this is the one that deserved chucking out <laughs> it, it really is it's it's just it's so badly put together i don't know you know it's hard for me to emphasize just how bad the army list actually is like how internally inconsistent how boring i mean that's the cardinal sin right for any hobby thing for any created thing it can be bad if it's interesting you know yeah yeah things can be bad and interesting and bad and fun this is bad and boring we've and all boring. seen enough hellraiser sequels to know that that is right. absolutely the truth Absolutely. Yeah, Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. It's shite, but it's loads of fun. <laughs> this is not that. This is no. not that. This is just, it's dull. It's dull, 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 dull. And there's a reason why. You know when they ever do like the big 40k retrospectives when they do the anniversary stuff in White Dwarf? Mm -hmm. They always miss this out. Always. It's never even mentioned. Not once. No pictures okay. of it, nothing. It's amazing. They skip the, straight from this to the sixth ed Chaos Space Marine book. Mm -hmm. It's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. They know. They know. Oh, they absolutely. Sew. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the amount of damage that that book did to 40k as a brand is mm -hmm. you know, very it's apparent. It's oh, yeah. is, It is very apparent. Because again, people didn't start to crawl back until later. 
until like seventh ed, the end of seventh ed, when you started to get the gene stealer cults coming back, mm -hmm. when you started to get the, uh, when we got the thousand sons back, mm -hmm. bloody hell, when Magnus returned, of course, that's when things started to turn around. And I will say, you know, to get past the negativity and whatnot, since then, it has just been escalating. It's been uh, like the eighth ed Chaos Space Ring Codex, brilliant. Ninth mm -hmm. ed, even better. Tenth ed, I haven't done my Ages of Chaos on this yet. And the reason I haven't done it is because I want to do it justice. This, I, I will say, is the best Chaos Space Marine Codex since this one. Best one since 3.5. Yep. By a country mile. By wow. a co you know what it does? Do you know what it does? It takes the philosophy of this one. You mm -hmm. know, the background stuff where it wants you to do your own thing. It wants you to do, it wants you to come up with your own background and your own chapters and your own narrative. But it also, it, it makes it possible in the army list. It baits that into the army list and not just into the background. So this is the one that succeeds. This is the one that succeeds. It's a really, really, really good book. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think, yeah, as I said, best Chaos Space Marine Codex since 3.5 insofar as I'm concerned. Really bloody good stuff. And I'll tell you what, they play so well. Oh, they they are great. Chaos Space Marines in this book, so good. So good. There's hardly, you know, the thing they've done with 10th Ed where they've tried to prune away redundancy. So that, yeah, Rufus, I know, sorry, she's having a go at me because I'm up too late. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that's what they've done here. Everything, <laughs> works. Everything works, you know? All of the detachments are good. All of the units have a place and a purpose there's not like one unit you would take over another in the same slot because they all have their own unique functions it's it's a it's a really excellent piece of work this book i am so impressed and if this is the way chaos is going to be in 10th then yeah i'm very pleased <laughs> i'm very pleased i want to uh, put a little thing out to the um, the chat as well. If you're uh, in the the current chat, if you're not in the chat, then you can't take place in this. So no. um, come come join the chat. Uh, not that you'll hear this now. Obviously, you'll hear this in the future. But uh, no. just know that in the past, you could have joined the chat. Um, guys in the chat, what about you guys? What out of fourth ed forty uh, k chaos space marines would you have kept? What would you have wanted to see evolve? Is there anything that you'd like to have seen? just carry on you know let, just as a positive and also in the same way what was the single worst thing for you guys in that book because i really want to know um just write it down in the chat and we shall read that out shortly there's think, a, there'll probably be a loss <laughs> and the the other question of course i've got is andy here's space marines in general yeah Right. Have, have there ever been a uh, an army that you've been interested in? Has there ever been a point where you thought, actually, I really would like to do a Chaos Space Marine Force? Uh, uh, not particularly. I think the the models were always nice, and I like the background, but they they always uh, felt like the the basic choice to go for, like the Ultramarine mm -hmm. kind of choice. You go, oh, well, if you you know, again to Warhammer, you get Space Marines, or you get Chaos Space Marines, and that's kind of the two choices, the the main focus you go for. So then, mm -hmm. whenever it's something I, I was desperately interested in, is no. it the case of like the other silhouette that's as recognizable to like people who are not Warhammer fans as the Space Marine is the Corn Berserker? Oh, I don't Bundy know. Is and everything. Quite possibly. I would have always said the Terminator. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's probably true too. I mean, the, what's funny is that the Chaos Terminators, the ones with the great big horns coming out the front. They're always a very iconic look as well. The tusks. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Love that so much. I mean, that's it, been a thing in second ed, hasn't it? That's where yeah. they came from. It was the uh, the metal Chaos Terminators from that era. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. As much as I love the Rogue Trader ones, there's just something good about big horns, big tusks. Yeah, I, I've always had a real soft spot for those Terminators. I remember having them as a kid, like the set, you mm. know? And yeah, it was. It's a lovely thing. It's a lovely thing. They just look so baroque and so twisted. And mm. now, nah, give, yeah. give me the Nurgle Terminators from Rogue Trader. <laughs> They're real twisted. 
and they're very good very good i mean like i mean i've got to say like the nurgle terminators from now you know the blight lords and the mm -hmm. death shroud they're some of my favorites yeah. ever some of my favorites ever love them the only reason i talked to andy is because i know that you have a um you've got thousand sons haven't you from the prospero burns set yes yeah yeah oh really mm -hmm. yep <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I mean, they're just thirty k for the most part, so there's nothing super no, chaotic about, about them. Yeah, no. but even so, yeah. I, I just liked how George just kind of started just going, mm, mm, well, thousand suns, thousand suns. Mm. Yeah, I can't can't help it. They're great. I've got like <laughs> one unit of like um just standard rubrics as well, and and the uh, the sorcerers, but I never decided to go for a full army, mainly because I hadn't <laughs> finished the ones I had, so there wasn't much point. No, no, no that, that makes sense. They're a good one to go for in tenth. I can tell you, they're they're sitting pretty at the moment. Not if you want to paint them, they're a pain in the ass to paint. <laughs> yeah, a pain in the ass to paint. They are, yeah. <laughs> they're basically like the Eldari of the Chaos Forces, yeah. aren't they? They've got loads of like elaborate stuff all over them. Stripes, loads of gold. Don't yeah, mess it up. yeah, yeah. Were you going blue and gold, or were you doing the um, the red? I was doing red. Mm -hmm. yeah, classic Prosperine uh, Thousand Sons, yeah. God, Andy, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if if I could send somebody around to paint all your Thousand Sons for you, I would. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fine, you know. I I, I liked uh, the Prospero Burns book, so it was my own fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and it was a nice box set. An absolutely yeah, beautiful yeah. box set. Oh, man, I just kind of wish. It, it's a weird one because I've never really done Chaos Marines. Um, no, you haven't, have you, Adam? No, no, it's it, it's a strange one outside of the Skaven and obviously Chaos Dwarfs. Um, obviously, I've never really done Chaos as a whole. Um, no. I had a small Beastmen force way back when, mm -hmm. um, but it's mostly just been Skaven Chaos Dwarfs. They are my my yeah. go-to for Chaos, which you don't get in 40k. So no, of course, yeah, <laughs> there are armies that don't really have an equivalent. Well, technically, you do have Beastmen now. In a very oh yeah, sense. Got beast men. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hang on, they're actually uh, an entry now, which is nice. I do actually have food. some forty k beastmen up on the shelf somewhere. Sorry, that's my cat meowing. By the way, she's telling me off. <laughs> there, you are. yeah, Felgor beastmen. They're actually a unit in the Chaos Space Marine Codex now, which is lovely. Out of interest, oh. is the um, the Gellapox in that book? They're not be. really. No. Do you know where they're going to be? That might be in the Death Guard book. Maybe, mm, maybe. They might be in the Death Guard book. Because no, that, that's the thing that would get me into doing a Chaos Space Marine Army currently. Oh, having would a be yeah. Just having a, a yeah, yellow box, yellow box, pox. Just, just having a pox on both your houses. Um, <laughs> just having like an army based around them. Because mm. that would just be such an interesting looking army to have. There's some weird, there's some weird rumors floating around about the way, like the the cult Chaos Space Marine armies are going to manifest in tenth. A lot of people are saying that, you know, the um, the much maligned decision to separate demons from Chaos Space Marines, um, which started here, mm -hmm. that one of the rumors, one of the weirder rumors floating around is they're going to reverse that, so that the cult Chaos Space Marine books are going to be more like the the cult books in AOS. You know where you get mortals and demons thrown together. So the, apparently, and you know this may not be true; it may not pan out. But apparently, your Death Guard are going to have Nurgle demons in their book, and Thousand Sons are going to have Zeech demons in their book, and so on and so forth. That would make sense. Mm -hmm. That would make enormous sense because in the background and the imagery, those armies always fight alongside the, the demons of their Chaos God. But the demons also plug certain gaps in those army lists. It would make enormous sense because demons have never worked as an army in 40k ever, ever, ever. They've always sucked because they yeah. just they're just not meant to function as a whole army. Yeah, it's a strange one, isn't it? It's the the difference between trying to um, make something that makes that connects into the background mm -hmm. compared to making something that happens on the battlefield and right you know two very different things you know here's how things work in the, the stories and the lore and mm -hmm. the fluff and all that type of things and then let's get it on the battlefield uh, well the this is the, this is the funny thing in the 
background, demons primarily manifest where there are Chaos Space Marines because they're the ones who are like creating the circumstances where they can manifest. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a bizarre thing. Obviously, you do get armies of demons because you get things like warp rifts and whatnot, and you know, warp storms and planets get engulfed by them. And yeah, you get like swarms of demons coming through. So the notion of there being an army list for demons isn't a bad thing. It's just it's never been done well. It's never worked. No, no. <laughs> Demons suffer badly in 40k because they're primarily a close combat army. Mm-hmm. And 40k is difficult for close combat armies unless they're really well balanced, like the World Eaters. The World yeah, Eaters yeah. work really, really well. Um, oh. I'm trying to think of others that, <laughs> that actually function properly some of the eldari builds work really well <laughs> they're, not, they're the eldari and they're broken perpetually broken what is it about the eldari and games workshops inability to balance them <laughs> like every edition whenever they come out they're killer every single edition they dominate i think it's purely down to the fact that um the design studio love the Eldari and they want to do I, lots of interesting stuff with them. I can and sort then, of see why, you know, I get that. And then it gets to like the miniature designers and they're all like, fucking what? No. Yeah. Please, please yeah. don't make me do this. I yeah, want to I mean, make Rat with Bomb. Know, that's the other rumor that's floating around. Apparently, your new warp spiders, uh, we'll see, mm. right? And even apparently a Phoenix Lord for the warp spiders for the first time. Because there must be one. There was. If, if, there's a, if there's a shrine of of an aspect, then there's got to be um, a phoenix lord. There was. There was in the second edition 40k, I'm sure of it. No, there wasn't. No, there no. wasn't a, a warp spider phoenix lord. No, there's never been one. For some reason, there's never been one. There's not even a mention of one, no. which is really weird. What am I thinking of? Achra, maybe? You may be thinking of, like, the first striking scorpion, uh, Phoenix Lord, who was actually... Uh, Kaelor Ross. That's what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of Kaelor Ross, the rough spider. Of... Who's that? Oh, we are going back now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, what's that? <laughs> Who is that? You'll never know. No, oh, he's frozen. Yeah, <laughs> secrets. Inquisitorial um, spam. Yeah, I beat him. Oh, yeah, I beat me. Yeah. Uh, who may be a warp spider's Phoenix Lord, perhaps even the aspects of Sura, the first Phoenix Lord. The truth of the matter may not even be known. It's one of those little things that was in a tiny little cutout. And Ah, uh, interesting. I imagine it's got I'm way concerned. Of yeah, I am concerned that my brain remembers a cutout. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining that isn't canon anymore. Probably not. Probably not. Um, but no, it's interesting, isn't it? I wonder why. Because all of the others have their Phoenix Lord. They've had it since Second Ed. Yeah. They've, they're dedicated, and their model as well. They've had a, a dedicated model. So. And some of them have had two in 30 years. Some of them have had two. Some of the more fortunate ones, yes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to when they update Fugan, the, the Fire Dragon one. I mm. love it. I mean, he was always my favourite, and I, oh God, I can't wait to see what they do with him. I always find it funny with the warp warp spiders that in the background they're like these super scuttly around, speedy little yeah. guys. Like and scary then you see, yeah, they're supposed you see to the be like sinister. Uh, yeah, the miniatures are kind of cute. <laughs> well, the Eldar like Terminators, eggy, like eggy heads. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird, right? Well, the, the suits in the in the background and in the artwork, the suit is supposed to be like. They meant they to have multiple limbs coming out of them, mm-hmm. like mechanical limbs and things, and you know. <laughs> but they don't have that in the, in the miniatures, apart from the Exarch, which is, is kind of weird. <laughs> um, so over in the chat, uh, we've got two uh, responses. Um, Monkfin says, Warbands, I think. I never mm-hmm. quite got on with the idea of Marines existing in Legion strength to the modern era of 40k at the time. I'd read yeah. about small groups which worked with def- defectors and similar, which made more sense. Sure, yeah. they may know they work with the wider Legionnaires they knew, but they always felt that they should be cells rather than a gestalt. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, yeah I'd agree totally with that. Get that. Totally get that. Um, 
Big Swiggin D says, Renegades and Warbands fluff was excellent. What you see, what yeah. you get on Marks of Chaos and the lack of consistency between the marks on characters and units was dire. Yep, yeah, it was. It was. He is absolutely... That seems to be the, the consistent thing, right? People like the, the attempt to diversify in the background, introducing mm. new stuff rather than just reproducing the stuff from Second Ed. Yeah, um, that's yeah. really, I mean, I liked it when they did it later on as well. You know, when they introduced the Crimson Slaughter in Sixth Ed, mm -hmm. I loved that. A lot of people didn't. A lot of people didn't because they thought they were ignoring the legions. You know, which they were. They absolutely were. But I really love the Crimson Slaughter. I mean, another thing I would love to talk about when we get round to it in another video is the Crimson Slaughter codexes, because they they've had two codices. You know, they have. They and have really. They're really, really good. Why? Why are they so good? It makes no sense. I know, especially when you consider the base Chaos Space Marine Codex that they're based on, which is the Sixth Ed Codex, isn't very good. Mm. Mm. Well, you know what the problem with the Sixth Ed Codex is? The Sixth Ed Codex uses this codex as its base, and so it's bound to be pretty bad. <laughs> Why? <It's great. laughs> Um, right then, so I've got a final thing that I want to do with you guys. Yep. Sure. So, do you remember many, many years ago how we used to end a show? We used to end a uh, show by creating a character using a oh random yeah. rolls table. It wasn't that long that. ago, was it? Yeah, it was three years ago. <laughs> since oh. it. Two years ago, at least. It's It's been a while since we've done it. Um, the idea, of course, was that we were going to try and do like a... Uh, five minute rpg at the end of the the shows which didn't happen because it takes work mm -hmm. but what i've got here is a book called grave mutations okay so what i want you both to do is find a d1000 roller <laughs> okay and give me three rolls and what we're going to do is we're going to create a chaos space marine using these okay. mutations interesting are you up andy are you ready for this yeah i'm gonna have to um uh, uh, to, to turn off the screen so i can go and uh, find it well, george can roll for you if you if oh, you want yeah sure <laughs> it means they'll keep uh, the, the screen interesting for the yeah. people at least okay we're ready okay uh do you want to roll three for yourself and three for andy or do you want to take turns I don't mind either way. So three and then three, you'll be easier. Okay. Okay. All right. So right. Roll, roll three times for yourself. Okay. So five to seven. Five to seven. 80. Okay. And 96. All right. Five to seven, 80, and 96. Okay. And for Andy. So write down these, before you do that, write down these ones. You have claw hands. Right. right. Redundant organs. Okay. <laughs> and bleeder. You bleed freely from the smallest of wounds. Oh. Oh. Okay. All right. And for Andy? So for Andy, we have 270. Five. And 649. Jesus. Toxic bile. Nice. Vampiric. Also nice. What was the last one again, sorry? Uh, 649. Hideous stench. Hmm. Oh, not so nice. <laughs> Actually, but, Andy, that's 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 basically like a, a kind of vampire. That's an undead thing. That's you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Oh, shit. It's, uh, yeah. That's not yeah. so bad, actually. It's pretty, it's pretty kind of rolling. Yeah. 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 So uh, they, they are your Chaos Space Marine. So what, what have you got? What what can you do with them to turn them into a Chaos Space Marine oh, of your choosing? Wounded and horrible. He's got to be a Plague Marine, right? He's got to mm. be a Death Guard. He's got to be a Nurgle worshipper of some description. He's got, you know, he's got an, he's got a disease that makes him bleed all over the place. He's got organs all over the place, and he's got hideous encrusted talons. Yeah, he's a Nurgle worshipper of some description. 
as is mine. I mean, it's got tons yeah. of bile and a hideous stench. I mean, it's kind of yeah. uh, prerequisite, really. Absolutely, yeah. So two Nurgle worshippers, please. <laughs> two just two of Nurgle. Yep, just two members of the Death Guard. Oh, yeah. oh well. <laughs> if either, you know, Andy, if you do start developing like trilobes of boils or something over the next couple of days, no more than usual. You know, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> Basically, don't blame me. I'm, I am not to blame. You can't blame me for any of this. Well, it's fine. You know, it will hurt for a little while, and then you'll grow to love it. So it's it's fine. <laughs> no, that's what Papa Nurgle does, right? I've told all We're my dates that as well. They've never agreed. <laughs> there is uh, one last thing that I, from the book I've just noticed. And you'll never know. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. Oh, no, I'm back, right? Re repeat it the, again, please. The um, Let the Galaxy Burn is a trademark tagline in the uh, <laughs> the intro to the, the book. Oh, oh is it trademarked okay. today? No, no it's trademarked from 2007. Oh, yeah, it will be trademarked. No, the Games Workshop does not leave their trademarks. Yeah. So was this the first time that they had the trademark? It must be. I've never seen that before. I've never oh, seen... Wow. It actually says... Let the galaxy burn tag in their list of trademarks. Let the Gary burn. <laughs> <laughs> Let the galaxy burn. Let the Gary Gary burn. <laughs> Don't burn Gary Gary. <laughs> who, who would you give free cats to? That's true. That's true. <laughs> Jesus. How long did his name end up being? And Gary remember. Gary free cat. Free cat. Gary Gary free cat. Two children. How old is this reference Nicholson. that we're making? Oh, it's a decade, at least, <laughs> if not more. Ay, 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 do, 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 do. Yeah, that, that was the full name. No one's going to damn clue. It's going to be interesting when this one goes out. I'm fascinated to see what people, how people respond to, you know, the the fourth ed codex, the 3.5 codex, all that, you know. And how many people have a similar experience or a different experience you know i'd be i'd be very happy to hear from people who actually like enjoyed playing with this one mm -hmm. that would make a, a pleasant change <laughs> to be fair mostly the show's been about the the, the fourth codex rather than the the 3.5 oh, yeah, 3.5 yeah. conversation has been it's just better it's and just pretty really, much it yeah it's just really good that i mean you know guys back me up you, it's good, right? This is this is one of the best Chaos Space Marine codices, yeah. Mm, three uh, three point five is the uh, second best codex, with the tenth being the. I don't know, but it tenth is very good. It's mm -hmm. very good. I mean, it's it's uh, yeah. I mean, the other thing I suppose is nostalgia with this as well. I mean, I was just starting uni when this came out, so it was like the first time I had my own money. Mm. So you know, there's a lot of that involved in this as well. And being out in the world and actually playing with this down at the local games workshop was loads of fun. So there was all that. Oh, do you remember when you could actually go into a games workshop and play a game? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Not allowed oh. to do that. <laughs> Can't have that. You know, used to love it. Used to mm. really enjoy it, you know. Oh, the good days. Good days. <laughs> mm. You kids now, you don't know you're born. Uh <laughs> <laughs> so with all that being said, then we will start closing things down. Uh, Andy, where can people find you if they wish to be infected by, what do you call your people? Dismembers. If they want to be dismembered. Is that what I call <laughs> them? I call them something. Uh, you can find me on YouTube and, and Twitch here. Uh, well, you, you probably find me on Twitch if you're watching the stream. Uh, it's Decayed Andy, <laughs> uh, and it's the same on YouTube as well. Also on the Moonbase 2 podcast, where we talk about Transformers every Sunday live, or you can just uh, download as Moonbase 2 Transformers podcast. We're still going. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you are. I mean, at this point in time, it's a Herculean effort. <laughs> And honestly, I, I take my hat off to you for keeping that going for as long as you, you have done. Pure stubbornness, nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I think you need to be in the Guinness Book of Records at this point. <laughs> yeah. Long, longest continuous Transformers podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 is that true? Because I don't, I think some of the American ones uh, are longer running, but I don't know. Radio, Radio Free Cybertron would be longer, but they took a six year break. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so come on, six year break is a stop. That's a you yeah, know, that's a stop yeah. and a start. Yeah, and then they they came back during that big push of Transformers podcasts in two thousand and a two thousand seven to two thousand nine. Mm -hmm. 
There was a, a thing on Facebook the other day that uh, uh, mutual friends Nicole and Slick were just re reminiscing about the random fandom, the show that they used to do, and Phil just going, oh, yeah, podcasts. Do you remember who does that? <laughs> and it's just me and Andy going, yep. F F excuse me. Yeah, never <laughs> stop. <laughs> never stop. I remember those. Uh, it's changed my sights and I've, I've never mm. stopped. Uh, I'll stop when I'm dead. <laughs> it's, at this point, I think that's very much the truth. Um, when I am buried, I will do my final podcast from inside the grave. Oh, you could do seance podcasts. You know, when they do mm. like uh, Ghost Adventures and other. You could get uh, Derek Ako Well, uh, I assume Derek Ako is <laughs> probably going to be dead before you. Uh, he's, dead he's, now. <laughs> he's dead now. Is he? Oh, he could yeah. have said, "What's Groff saying?" He's saying, "Suck my dick." He's telling me to suck my dick. <laughs> suck your dick, back. Groff. I'd, I'd come back uh, just to make Derek Akora say that, but uh, oh, no, I'll come back dragging Derek Akora's <laughs> ghost with me. <laughs> yeah, apologize, you fucker. Apologize, you fucking bastard. Come on, ghosts aren't real. Tell him. Tell him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What are the Even funniest the things? You could bloody channel, channel them, you fraud. <laughs> I've completely changed the metaphysics of the reality to get you to come back from the dead yeah. to apologize and tell people there aren't ghosts. Um, one of the funniest things that's come out from the interview, well, interview, the conversation that we had with Snipe and Wib has uh -huh. been that everybody just wants us to, uh, like those two and those two, to just do a ghost hunting show on YouTube with. Them. Oh, I am so up for that. And it, it it's ridiculous how many comments I've had of people who just want to see that. So um, I am so up for that. I mean, I only live up the road from them. They're they're in Derby, aren't they? So that's yeah. that's not very far from me at all. I can hop a train. Oh, well, I've been a bit difficult for me and Andy. <laughs> yeah, it is Man, a bit. impossible. <laughs> yeah, it's like very very far away <laughs> and you know responsibilities mm. god damn them but uh all that being said then um andy said here's george where can people find you uh people can find me over on exaggerated elegy on youtube been a bit quiet because i've been on a very long stint of work lately and i'm going on holiday on monday so it's going to be a bit quieter still uh, you can find me over at the Ginger Nuts of Horror, where I'm doing the series of articles, My Life in Horror, where I dive deep into the uh, the media that's influenced me and my horror writing over the years. Uh, that's a lot of fun. If you go over to Arrow Films, as per usual, you can find the Quartet of Torment, the uh, Hellraiser UHD and Blu-ray set. And myself and my colleague, Kit Power, we're on the Hellbound disc, yeah, with the, on the feature at Hell is What They Wanted, which is an hour and 48-minute chat about Hellraiser, Clive Barker, and horror, and all sorts of things. It's great, great fun. If you want to read any of my published fiction, my short fiction, you can find links to all of it over at strangeplaygrounds.com. Or if you go on to Amazon and type in George Daniel Lee, you'll find my uh, Amazon author page. I think that's everything for me now and the important question i have to ask after that is because you were on the hellraiser um box set andy mm -hmm. yeah if you could be on any film series box set or just single film box set doing a commentary what film would it be i know what my answer is mm. i want to be on the split second starring rutger hauer oh my commentary <laughs> you don't want to be on um um the the fantastic four the roger Corman uh fantastic four set that would be good. That would yeah. be good. I mean, both of us on the uh, 1990 <laughs> Captain America film would be an <laughs> absolute riot. That would be fun. The Italian that Red would... Skull. Mm -hmm. yeah, on the Pinots. Would... The Pinot Keys. <laughs> the Slick Ivories. Um, I, you may, uh, a movie? Uh, Dagon would be quite fun. Ooh, that's mm -hmm. actually yeah. a good shout. That's a very he good shout. To fucker her. Yeah, that's always a classic line from that old mm -hmm. man who gets skinned. <laughs> um, all for a good movie, Lord of the Rings, but I, I wouldn't be able to do that film justice because it's too. It, there's so much. Yeah, yeah, and it's so good. Yeah, that would be good fun to do. They, they are my movies. If you're gonna say what what are my favorite movies, it'd be Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. You've done a Dagon commentary track. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, we um, lurkers the, in the, lurk the lobby. Lurkers in the lobby. Yeah, yeah. when we did the. Um, because both of us were bored shitless with the uh, the horror movies of the time, so yeah. we were 
we just went back and we found every single HP Lovecraft. We didn't do uh, every single one. We did no. most of them. Uh, and there we was did a, a lot of bad do. ones. Oh, yeah. most, most of them. Of bad. It's, it's, it's so them. interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting. Like the better Lovecraft films are the Lovecraft adjacent ones. Rats in the Walls was good. Like, like, yeah, you, I enjoyed Rats in the Walls. Yeah, yeah. yeah Rats yeah. in the Walls is good fun. But yeah, stuff like In the Mouth of Madness, um, The Void, that kind of thing. The Thing, obviously. You know, the Thing, mm -hmm. obviously. Alien. Yeah. Alien, mm. obviously. Alien is Technically, we could do a, uh, a Locus in the Lobby return for the, the Color of uh, Space. Color of oh, Space? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, the Nicolas Cage one. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's really good. And then there's I the... Like um, like actually, actually, no, there's about five, New ones. six... I would say there's about six films that have come out since then, hmm. since we did the, that series, that would actually be worth watching. There's the one about the, the Elder God hiding in a... Um, uh, toilet stall, <laughs> which is honestly, it, it's an What's amazing it film. I'm trying to remember. Um, yes, I know this. It's um, it's got uh, J.K. Mm -hmm. Simmons. Yes. Um, oh, what is it called? Hang on. Uh, Elder I can't God. It's very good. It's very good. Toilet. No, no, that's a lot of AI pictures. That's a lot of AI pictures. Yeah, Why am I getting forty k elder gods in toilets? Huh. There's that's also there's also Batman versus Cthulhu. Yeah, Glorious. Is called. I haven't heard of Glorious. It's called it's called Glorious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mumford's just. Uh, yeah, very. It's it's worth a look. It's worth a look. Mm, I really, really enjoyed it. And then there's the one about the guys going back to the cult that they grew up in. Um, oh, that one, yeah. I can't remember what it's called, but that's a really good movie. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that one. Yeah. Um, especially just a bit with the playing tug of war and the rope just keeps going. Mm. That was a really good moment. Um, yeah, there's, there's actually a few. We could probably bring Lurkers in the lobby back. Oh my god. Oh. Well, shit. technically, I mean, there's all the there's all the like the Slender Man stuff. That's Lovecraftian. Yeah, mm -hmm. loads of that. Yeah, I am not watching. Crap. No, I am not watching the Slender Man movie again. Oh, you watched not, it? No, not that. Oh, that's terrible! It. Like the main, like the the mainstream yeah. film. They made. Oh, it's garbage! It's absolutely garbage. It, it's, it's terrible. One of the worst experiences I've ever had watching a film. It is absolutely beyond garbage. awful. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's just as well you said one of the worst. <laughs> the point no, no. of like the original mythology just completely. Oh god! Yeah, it turned into a weird tree god. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's so strange. Ridiculous. But, yeah. Concrete hornets and stuff like that. That's um, marble hornets. Mar I mean, concrete hornets. Concrete wasps. <laughs> I think that's what I've done. Concrete wasps, yeah. marble hornets. Asphalt yeah. ants. I don't know. It's <laughs> one of them, isn't it? <laughs> oh, well, oh, I think we should leave now before I make it more Where can people myself. find you, though, at this podcast? Oh, God, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yes. <laughs> people find you. Possibly on the, a new season of Lurkers in the Lobby from the sounds of it. <laughs> Yeah. I, don't, I had an idea of how to start a new show and now I want to start two new shows that's not a good thing, that's really not a good thing <laughs> um, you can find me uh, well you can find the Fluff and Hammer at thefluffandhammer.com um, which has everything in it we have everything on there there is an article out every single day I try to do as many new articles a week as I physically can uh, articles could be anything from uh, the Heavy Metal Galleries which comes out every Monday and I realised today I Mm -hmm. what is wrong with me um, the Sunday musings where I time myself 90 minutes to write an article about something that's appeared in my head the last one was about the screaming 20s why Lovecraft's work usually works best when it's in the in the time period mm -hmm. um, when you move it into the 80s and 90s there's a tendency of falling down really bad see the Necronomicon film um, uh, and it could be anything from that. Uh, there's also tons of other stuff that I put out. Um, uh, videos, um, stories, yeah, short stories, all that type of stuff. There's lots and lots of stuff comes out from the Fluff and Hammer daily. Um, my own personal stuff, you can find me on Amazon under AD Nickel, uh, where my first book, Pig Iron, is available to buy. It is half a art book, half a... Descent into Madness, half a uh, really essay on that. creation and the creative process, and half a game Find the Pigman. Um, <laughs> oh, there's a lot of stuff in that 
it's it's a, it's a very strange book, good. but it's it's really good though. I li- I like the strangeness. I like the how eclectic it is. It's just my brain with a funnel. It's stuff, it. isn't it? It's like just it is just stuff. It's great fun. Yeah, it's just what happens inside my head, turned into a book. Um, into a the, book right, yeah. the second of my books should be out in about three weeks, which is Under Stars Desolate, a skirmish horror game, um, skirmish horror sci-fi game, uh, which it's not far off getting ready to go out now. It's not far off at all. Help me, help me. Um, and of course, my own personal website, which is adnickel.weebly.com, which has everything on it from my artwork through to my reading of uh, We Can um, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale by Philip K. Dick. It's oh, fabulous. Good choice. Lots of stuff on there. Uh, and of course, These Mean Streets, which is a, uh audiobook about the 2D fighting game <laughs> genre. So Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> A lot of shit. A lot of shit in my brain. <laughs> Lots of stuff going on. <laughs> so with all that being said, we will get out of here. Thank you very much for listening, if indeed you still are. Good night. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Not every man truly dies.